It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our convocation speaker. Abdallah Dar is a professor of public health sciences and of surgery, director of ethics and commercialization at the McLaughlin Rockman Center for Global Health, and the chief science and ethics officer and chair of the scientific advisory board of Grand Challenges of Canada. After attending medical school in Uganda and London, England, he went to the University of Oxford for postgraduate clinical training in surgery and also in internal medicine, earning a doctorate in transplant immunology and a fellowship in transplantation. He was a clinical lecturer in Oxford for several years before going to the Middle East to help start, start two medical schools. He was the foundation chair of surgery in Oman for a decade before coming to the University of Toronto in 2001. His major research focus is on the use of life sciences to ameliorate global health inequities, with a particular focus on building scientific capacity and increasing innovation in developing countries, in addition to studying how technologies can be rapidly taken from lab to village. His international awards include the Hunterian Professorship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and the UNESCO Avicenna Prize for Ethics of Science, and he holds the official world record for performing the youngest kidney transplant. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, and the New York Academy of Sciences, and is a senior fellow of Massey College, University of Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Abdallah Dar. Chancellor, Vice President, Principal, members of the procession, honored guests, parents, and most importantly, graduating students. Let me start by congratulating all of our graduating students for your hard work and success in getting here today. On this important day, why do I wish that I were in your place and not in my place? Because there is more uncertainty in your lives, and that means more promise, a greater flutter of the heart, more likelihood of more silos being shattered, a more equal and just world. Among you are those so privileged you came to this great university almost by birthright. Others have struggled and sacrificed greatly to get here. Your individual stories are fascinating, yet you share many wonderful values. Your generation is less likely to judge others by wealth or background, religion, sexual orientation, or skin color. Let me tell you a story. When I was a surgeon in Oman, I had a wonderful Canadian colleague called MacDonald, who had strong, healthy daughters and sons, one of whom had a new girlfriend. He called home one day to say he was bringing Jane for dinner. And when they arrived, the parents had a slightly quizzical look and called the son aside. And Dr. MacDonald said, why didn't you tell us on the phone Jane was black? The son replied, dead, I hadn't noticed. That is one reason why I came to Canada and why this is such a great country. Today is a day of many transitions for you from the womb of the university to the world of work, from the loving embrace of parents to the world of outside freedom, from dependency to independence, from youth to adulthood. But what will you make of that growing up? Adults are not that smart after all. One of my favorite books is The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry in which the little prince says, grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children, always and forever explaining things to them. I learned from the little prince to see everything with childlike wonder. So what else do incipient grown-ups like you need to know? 
Humanity has never had so many tools with which to build a more perfect life. Cheap travel, computers, cell phones, the internet, social networks, the ability with one click to donate a mosquito bed net that might save an African child from dying of malaria. But in these times of transition, all this may seem confusing, and you may think that you are alone in this confusion, but you are not. None of you knows where you will be or what you will be doing in five years. So relax. Be excited and challenged by the uncertainty, knowing it will all work out well in the end, gloriously. The very meaning of life is change, and all change, even at the DNA level, is risky. You could spend much time worrying, trying to mitigate risk. You will not always succeed. And if you try to mitigate every risk, you will mitigate the very joy out of life. There will always be black swans. Learn early what's important and what's not, and don't sweat the small stuff. Learn to listen to your inner voice. And if it says, take that fork in the road, take it. And if that turns out to be wrong, learn from the experience and move on. That inner voice in time will help you distinguish calculated risks from recklessness. But first you need to foster that inner voice through sincere and honest reflection. Don't sleep without reflecting on your day's actions and their motives. That inner voice will become your best friend. It may not always seem rational or logical at first because some of what it says comes from the heart. But it will help you chart your own road in life, allowing you to grow naturally, alone internally, but outside in comradeship, working with others in groups, yet avoiding groupthink. It will become the seat of your passion your idealism, the font of all your innovation. Without that inner voice, there is no real you. So if it means taking a year or two to backpack in the Andes or the Himalayas to discover it, that will be time well spent. But if you discover it early here at University Avenue, that's great too, for it will leave you more time to travel and travel allows you to listen to the stories of other people. As Athol Fugard observed, the only safe place is inside a story. You can have no empathy, no full human life, if you don't learn to listen to other people's stories and let them touch you. When I was a medical student in Uganda and violence and madness broke out around me, there were times when death was very close. That sense of vulnerability shaped my approach to life. I learned to value all life immensely and to realize that others have needs and sufferings that I may be able to alleviate through my work. Later, as a transplant surgeon, I learned in a very practical way what life and death actually mean. So when is it that a person dies? It is not when the heart stops, because the heart can be restarted. It is when the brain dies that a person really dies. This is why the human brain with its mind is the greatest, most important, most evolved gift in the whole of creation. To waste it, to let it lie fallow, not to use it to reduce life's inequities is a huge crime. To misuse it, to reduce the sum of goodness in creation through the use of your mind is an even greater crime. Brain death has thus become the basis of organ donation for transplantation, which is a direct form of altruism. I believe that altruism is hardwired in us, ultimately an expression of our common humanity, of thinking of ourselves as members of one species, with not just rights, but duties and obligations to one another and with stewardship responsibilities to nature and the environment. The African philosophy of Ubuntu says, I am because we are. And no one has expressed this sentiment better than Martin Luther King when he said, 
it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. As you go out into the world, <clears throat> you will interact with many people. How will you know them? You could ask them, what books do they read? What is their most memorable moment or moving moment? Or what is their greatest mistake? My most memorable moment was when an incredibly sad mother approached to ask me to remove the tiny kidneys of a prematurely born baby with brain abnormalities that resulted in his death. She wanted me to transplant them into another child who would otherwise die without functioning kidneys. I am sure that that bereaving mother would glad gladly have given up her own life to save her child, but she could not. And here she was thinking only of how she could help save the life of another child through that singular act of generosity. And my biggest mistake? It was to have spent so little time with my children when they were growing up. One of them is in the audience. I was too busy studying and working and doing research. I wish I had learned then how important it is to lead a balanced life. My biggest regret. In the end, you will ask yourselves if you have led a good life. How will you know? Did you sleep easily at night? Did you make a difference? Were you part of a community? Healthy food, exercise, not smoking, will increase your life expectancy to some extent. What will make a bigger difference, though, is having close friends, a loving family, being part of a caring, mutually supportive community that hugs and kisses and creates healthy interdependencies. I love the saying, a stranger is a friend I haven't met yet. These are the things that will give you your own ikigai, as the Japanese call it, the reason to wake up in the morning, the reason for being. Today the sun rose at 5.38 or 6 in Toronto. So let me read this little poem I wrote for you. I have called it 05386. Beguiling, mysterious, searching as a five-year-old granddaughter's smile, today's first rays peaked from the edges of darkness, seemed to ask, will you journey with me mile after mile until I'm commanded back across the horizon at dusk? Choiceless, will my essence reveal you trampling, to reveal your trampling iron-tinged leather boots, hurting, humiliating, adding more ice water to that sack around your core, or show you sandaled, sapiential, stopping to smell those frangipani shoots on your way out to listen to the story of the other? That flame in the belly, what is it to achieve? a chance to illumine those dark spaces where silent tears flow, adding another strand to Martin Luther's weave? For when you call, there is never an answer, only an echo, an echo. So congratulations again. Go in confidence. The world is waiting.